This is CBC Here and Now. To grow up in uh, in Trinity Bay North was the furthest thing from our mind. I'll be the first one over there lined up with my resume saying, hire me. <laughs> we were thinking about something that was taking place with the fishery. Highs to buy. Port Union's fish plant could get an overhaul thanks to a different kind of plant. Welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Jeremy Eaton. It's been eight years since Hurricane Igor devastated Trinity Bay North's primary source of employment. But the Ocean Choice International plant in Port Union could have a breath of new life coming in the form of cannabis. Perhaps a toke of new life? Here now as Allison Sampson looks at how pot could give the town a new high. It's not much to look at now, but the seeds are being planted to start an industrial sized grow up in Port Union. Uh, this means the world to me. Uh, I, I love that I can come home uh, and create work and have uh, an impact on the community uh, where you know, uh, the construction jobs and then the, the sleeper jobs in the community. It, it affects people's lives, children's lives, um, and, and it creates a, a, a massive employ, employment spinoff. Daniel Porter is hoping the plant will employ 70 to 100 people when the facility is in full operation. They're hoping to produce 10,000 kilos of cannabis a year. That would mean 24 hours and 365 days of operation in the community where people are struggling to find a job that lasts more than the summer. We were a force to reckon with. Um, and then there were different shutdowns in the fishery and in the seal industry, and, and we were hit hard in the, and of course, Hurricane Igor in 2010. Um, so I'm looking forward to us now being again a, a major um, player in the, econ in the economy and the region. Former plant workers are already lining up for a chance to work year round in the community. Well, I'll be the first one over there lined up with my resume saying, hire me. <laughs> and I really hope that it comes here because if it doesn't come here, then it's going to bring jobs somewhere else. So we need the jobs as well as other communities. Before anyone can begin work here, the paperwork still needs to be finalized. Then licensing could take six months to a year before any seeds are put in the ground. Allison Sampson, CBC News, Port Union. Some schools in St. John's had to go into secure mode today after a man made threats. At this point, we don't know the nature of those threats. Here now's Glenn Payette is live tonight from Holy Heart High School. Glenn. Well, the threats were apparently made by a 19 year old man on social media, and they were so serious that the RNC and schools like Holy Heart here jumped into action. Now, the police were at Holy Heart uh, for several hours, and the school was put into secure mode, meaning students were kept in their classrooms. Well, we understand the same thing happened at nearby Brother Rice Junior High and St. Bonds and other schools. Uh, just before 11 a.m. this morning, uh, patrol officers responded to a threats complaint at Holy Heart of Mary High School in uh, St. John's. Uh, patrol officers were able to identify a 19-year-old male who had made the threats, and that male was located in the area of Logie Bay Road in St. John's. The male was arrested in relation to threats and a breach of recog, cognizance, and he was brought to holding cells to appear in court. Now, to repeat, we don't know the nature of the threats. We don't know, know if they were aimed at Holy Heart or an individual. Now, because this man has a breach of a recog, which is essentially a court order, it means he has a previous record. Now, the 19-year-old was supposed to appear in court at Atlantic Place here in St. John's this afternoon. That didn't happen for whatever reason. So he should appear tomorrow morning. Reporting live from St. John's, I'm Glenn Payette for Here and Now. Feel if you moved into this apartment, would you be mad with your landlord? Get down and just look at the dirt that's hanging off of them. What if your landlord was Newfoundland and Labrador Housing? We'll bring you that story coming up on Here and Now. The town of Paradise is willing to go to court to keep its cameras rolling. It's been two weeks since the privacy commissioner told the town to shut off dozens of surveillance cameras, but the mayor isn't backing down. Here and Now's Ryan Cook explains. The cameras are staying on. The town of Paradise has officially responded to the Privacy Commissioner's recommendations, saying they will not shut off their cameras, and they've got their reasons. 
we weren't prepared to turn off our cameras. Uh, you know, we installed the cameras initially because we've had a few break-ins. We have had people pull fire alarms, false fire alarms, uh, vandalism, and overall protection of our uh, users and our employees in the buildings, right? There are 87 cameras here in Paradise. Most of them are on the outside, but some are inside these buildings, recording employees and staff-only areas. The town says these aren't in private areas, no washrooms or change rooms, and staff had a warning before they were installed. Privacy Commissioner Donovan Malloy wanted to know more about the incidents of vandalism and mischief, but said Paradise did not respond to those requests. He didn't feel the town had justified having the cameras, and he wants them turned off. Paradise had 10 days to reply to that recommendation, but the mayor says that wasn't enough time for them to supply the information Malloy needed. We'll, we'll continue to work with them, uh, but uh, and we still remain firm on saying that we are not turning off our cameras because we, we employed those cameras for a reason. And if they can't get this resolved in a friendly fashion, Bobbitt expects to be before a judge by the end of 2018, an expense he'd like the taxpayers to be able to avoid. Ryan Cook, CBC News. Paradise. So let's look at those numbers in Paradise. There are 87 security cameras on or inside buildings owned by the town. 25 employees can access those cameras, which stream video in real time. And this is the sixth time the Privacy Commissioner has raised concerns with Paradise in just five months. Now, most of those privacy concerns are related to John Roberts. He was Mayor Dan Bobbitt's opponent in the last election. When Roberts asked for the town's 2017 voting records and the surveillance video, he found out that the town had destroyed both. For his part, Mayor Bobbitt says Paradise is being transparent about its cameras, and if residents are obeying the law, they have nothing to fear. So we're going to bring uh, weatherman Ryan. So obviously, let's just uh, address the elephant in the room. I am obviously not Debbie Cooper. I am uh, Jeremy Eaton. I'm filling in for Debbie Cooper tonight. Peter Cowell must have been away. CBC mm. uh, reached down to the bottom of the barrel and found me. So that's why I'm sitting in here tonight. And uh, you guys are so supportive. The, uh, we're the, uh, the esteem <laughs> session happens <laughs> after the show. <laughs> uh, you know, just a few jokes. Uh, anyways, Ryan, I'm hoping that maybe I can get out and uh, work on my tan so I can feel better about myself tomorrow. Uh, is that going to happen? I uh, know, no. And if you're looking you mean, to go for a run, you mean he won't feel better for himself? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, it's not really going to be a great day for getting out tomorrow. Uh, certainly into the morning hours, we've got rain to deal with. It is going to brighten up a little bit into the afternoon, and just but still some drizzle lingering along. Let's uh, have a look at uh, the outlook. You know, tomorrow's Friday. Obviously, folks are looking to maybe get out and about, and of course, the weekend is. Uh, almost here and so let's uh, roll down uh, roll out how things are going to play out friday morning timeline here quiet start for central and west uh, a bit of a messy mix early on for st john's a few wet flakes perhaps a few ice pellets and then it's over to some shower uh, rain activity uh, through the morning into the afternoon as mentioned just a bit of lingering drizzle the steadiest rain uh, has uh, departed for central the northeast coast we're going to be seeing a messy mix of snow ice pellets freezing rain Snow continues for western Newfoundland into the northern peninsula and southeastern Labrador through Friday evening into Saturday morning, uh, just tapering off to flurries along the west coast. But this continues to be a story for southeastern parts of Labrador. And this low will slowly depart, and we'll see some wraparound shower flurry chances for central uh, into the Saturday afternoon time period, but not a bad day in the east for Saturday. And, and then that low will continue to depart on Sunday slowly drying out and this will set the stage uh, for what looks to be a, a, again a pretty nice stretch setting up for next week. I'll run you right through the next few days coming up in just a few minutes. Jeremy and Anthony. A woman in St. John's says Newfoundland and Labrador housing handed her a filthy apartment. Yesterday, Lindsay Whiffen got the keys to her new affordable housing unit only to find that several rooms hadn't been cleaned. Whiffen needs the affordable unit but says that no renter in the private market would put up with those kinds of conditions. Here now Zach Gowdy has more. Okay. Okay, so this is the unit. Imagine stepping inside your new apartment and seeing this. This is, I don't know, under here. Ooh, that's I mean, a mess. I don't even know what's growing off of that. <laughs> so this is how you found the place? This is exactly how the keys were handed to me yesterday. The keys were handed over by a Newfoundland and Labrador housing officer. But if this was a private rental, you would probably have some choice words for your landlord. 
So this is a shared stairwell, right? Shared, yes. Yeah. Body oh, yeah. Jeans. It's pretty dirty. I looked and I looked at this and I said, how can I bring my children here? You know, either way, a house is rent. If I were renting, paying $1,000 as opposed to, yes, having low income, is it still fair that I come into a filthy home and clean all this mess? Whiffen has two young children and currently pays $1,100 a month in rent. She says she needs affordable housing, but shouldn't have to give up her dignity. I have a quite fitting trade, but unfortunately, there's no work. So it's not like I'm just sitting home on my ass <laughs> trying to collect money from the government and taking advantage. I'm trying to better my children's lives so they don't have to live in this situation. Throw it out whatever's there. Yeah. Uh, this stuff? He said whatever's there, so whatever's there now is gone. While we were there, a Newfoundland and Labrador housing crew arrived to clear out the trash in the stairwell. Housing can't comment on this specific case, but says all units are cleaned and inspected before being transferred to new clients. It transfers about 400 units per year in the Avalon region alone, and says there are few complaints. Obviously, we do have a strict process that we follow straight across the province. Uh, based on the facts that the media has provided, I guess there was a breakdown in the process, so we certainly apologize for that, and that anything that the fact that it's been brought to our attention, any action that's required to correct the problem or follow up on the address will certainly be done. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, Lindsay reached out to us with that story. Uh, do you have one for us? If you do, get in touch with Here and Now. You can email us the address hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca or send us a message on Facebook or on Twitter at cbcnl. A 28-year-old 28 woman has been charged after police say she used a syringe full of blood to rob a store in Grand Falls, Windsor. The RCMP said the clerk was threatened during the holdup yesterday. The suspect demanded cartons of cigarettes before fleeing the convenience store on Bond Street. She was arrested at a home nearby and has been charged with armed robbery. A candidate who's facing two sexual assault charges has dropped out of the Nunatsiavut Assembly election. Roy Blake says negative and inaccurate information has been circulating and it's taking a toll on him and his family. Blake was first elected in 2014, but he resigned in November and last month he announced that he would be running again. The charges against Blake date back to the 1980s. A preliminary inquiry has been set for September. Many people are afraid of failure, but the thing is that there is a difference between being a failure and failing. You don't often get an award for failing, but that's exactly what happened to these business students. In 25 minutes, our Ramona Deering brings us the story of four international students who are rewarded for flopping. An upbeat mood and plenty of smiles. Not words you typically associate with Nalcor, but that, that's what was on display today at the corporation's annual general meeting in St. John's. Words like boondoggle and crisis replaced by words like profit and progress. The CBC's Terry Roberts was there and has this report. An ear-to-ear -ear smile from Stan Marshall. A spring in his step. I'm a lot happier now than I was two years ago. The audience in this St. John's hotel ballroom, attentive, friendly even. Just a few questions for the Nalcor Brass. Why? Because of this. We had a very, very successful, a tremendous year in 2017. We exceeded what everybody thought we could do. Marshall gave an update on the troubled Muskrat Falls project. And the news, for a change, was good. We've been successful in executing on our work. And so things are on schedule, uh, on time. What does that mean? That whopping $12.7 billion price tag is not growing. And First Power, still on target for a year from now. Still billions over budget and years behind schedule from when the project was first sanctioned, but now transitioning from construction to operation. Any mega project in the world would be happy to be where we are. 90% complete, but when the power starts surging from muskrat, so will our power bills. Expect them to double, says Marshall, despite repeated promises to try and ease the pain. It'll be that order of magnitude. Marshall is not happy about that, but says that's the situation he inherited when he took over the controversial project two years ago. This project, my opinions on this, I've expressed many times in the past, 
And you've got an inquirer looking at it now, and I'm sure I'll be a witness in that. But what I faced was a situation that was in crisis. You had to complete it. The only way to deal with this was to complete it. And to complete it at the lowest cost possible, with least impact on the consumer. And that's what I'm doing. And very little said about government's decision to break up Nalcor, splitting off the profitable oil and gas division led by this man into its own crown corporation. I'm totally okay with it. Still a tough situation, but not quite the disaster it once was. Oh yeah, we've, we've turned a corner. But Terry I'm Roberts, CBC it. News, St. John's. Now we asked the Minister of Natural Resources today about the prospect of doubling of power rates in this province. Here are some of what she had to say have to manage rates. We have made a commitment that we, we will be on par with Atlantic Canada. We have to be for competitiveness reasons. Ever since we've inherited the Muskrat Falls project, this government has been saying we're quite concerned about rising rates. And so therefore, we, we've been working very hard to make sure we manage and, uh, and remain competitive with Atlantic Canada. So just what rates would put us on par with the rest of Atlantic Canada, the Maritimes? Cody says it's about 18 cents per kilowatt hour and less. That's below what Nalcor is forecasting. So where will that money come to keep those rates down? Well, Cody says both the government and Nalcor are working on that. M MP Scott Sims is no longer chair of the Federal Government Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans. Sims lost a job because he didn't support an attestation that was included in the Canada Summer Jobs application. The Fed said they wouldn't give money to any group attempting to limit anyone else's rights. Sims says he's not surprised by the fact that he lost the post, which comes with a pay cut of just under $12,000. Fire gutted a bed and breakfast on the Avalon Peninsula yesterday. The Fairland Fire Department responded to a call around lunchtime Wednesday at Hagen's Hospitality Home near Aquafort. The crew put out a fire in the kitchen, but they were called back two hours later to find the entire home ablaze. The local fire chief called it an inferno and said he was shocked. Hagen's was a very well-known spot on the southern shore. Years ago, the woman who ran it, Rita Hagen, who died in 2012, was profiled on land and sea. She was known as a straight shooter whose hospitality was legendary, as was her cooking. If you stay here, it's easy enough to leave with a Rita story. One tourist from Australia turned his into a song, a song he posted on YouTube after making the near-fatal mistake of parking on Rita Hagen's lawn. Whoever comes to Rita's door will get a cup of tea. It's the finest hospitality you're ever like to see. Her tail will give you the biggest laugh you've had since you were born. But whatever you do, don't park your car on Rita Hagen's lawn. Don't be hungry. Because if you're hungry, that's your fault. I'll be damned on never not my fault. If you want bones or bread, or if you want whatever you want to eat, you go to the fridge and get it. My daughter in town called and said, Mom, you're on YouTube. I said, what the hell is YouTube? <laughs> I didn't even know, you know. But, uh, and so we looked it up on the computer. My daughter looked it up and here it was, right? Jesus. I don't mind telling you. If I had a hold of him then, I could have. He'd never live to get in through the door. With a pot of soup upon the stove and fresh tea buns of bacon. When are you going to retire? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is YouTube? Well, I ask that question every now and then myself. I, I've been saying that about Snapchat. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we ne I never had a chance to eat there. No, no, no I wasn't. No, but I've heard about it. And uh, of course, I've also know that uh, that Land and Sea episode was extremely popular. Was great character, that woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. If you couldn't tell by that clip we just showed. <laughs> The steep and narrow streets of the Battery in St. John's. Too small to get a fire truck down here, so what would the city do in a real emergency? Well, the pretend fire right now is into three houses. I'll tell you about their practice run coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to here now. More people in the province got a flu shot this year, but that didn't stop a spike in the number of confirmed cases. There have been 33 influenza deaths so far this year compared to just 14 last year. That's a jump of more than 50 percent. This despite a large flu shot campaign that led to more people getting the vaccine. 90 percent of those deaths involved people over the age of 65. The province's chief medical officer of health says the severe flu season was due to types to the types of flu strains that were circulating. Still, she recommends getting the shot, saying th those who contract the flu are likely to experience milder symptoms. A company that supplies snacks to convenience stores and gas stations across the province is recalling some of its products. Smith's Snacks is recalling 30 products due to possible hysteria contamination. Among the items are sandwiches, burgers, wraps and baked goods like apple flips, banana bread and pound cake. The recall was triggered by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which has a full list of these items on its website. Windsor Snacks has also issued a recall of Orange Store brand Big and Beefy Sandwiches, which has a best before date of April 18th. Topsail Road in St. John's is going to be closed tomorrow until Monday so that the new overpass can be installed. The overpass is part of the Tim Guju Highway that is still under construction. Traffic will have to take a detour through Burgio Street, Canada Drive and Black Marsh Road. The road is expected to reopen on Monday morning. For emergency workers, there's absolutely nothing like training for the real thing. That's why they're in that business, especially when they get a chance to prepare for the unusual that happens in emergency work. That's why so many of them today squeezed themselves into the battery in St. John's and they were squeezed in there along with our very own Garrett Barry. Here's the scenario. Serious weather turns to flooding and then to ice. At the same time, fire sweeps through these houses in the lower battery and the city of St. John's is forced into action. Well, the pretend fire right now is into three houses. Good luck getting a full size truck down these streets. Today, the St. John's Fire Department had to pack light. To a regular structure fire, we have seven vehicles, and that, that's only seven of our vehicles and 16 personnel. Now, to deploy them in an area such as this, where a lot of trucks can't go there, we have trucks positioned up in Fort Waldegrave and out on Battery Road by Cabot Avenue, and we can bring in our resources as we need them. But it, it's good for us because it gives us some training, because this is a very unique area. While they fought flames in close quarters, the Red Cross set up beds at the Paul Reynolds Community Center for residents who would have been evacuated. Uh, we set up a shelter for 44 people. In the scenario, how quickly was that filled? Um, that was in about an hour. We were able to set it up and then we were able to register in the same time frame about 50 individuals and 22 families. After the exercise, volunteers tear down. I'm just going to get out my team leaders just to ask what, what they thought went well. And then find out what didn't go well. Well, they're very useful because, uh, you know, you can have the best, uh, the best plan uh, in the world on paper. But when you look at how you do that operationally and how you move the various resources around and identify um, areas where you can improve, then that's, uh, um, uh, that's a big part of the process of preparing for that. Good practice for the volunteers who would be the ones getting the call in a real emergency. Garrett Barry, CBC News, St. John's. And remember, you can watch here and now while on the go. We are broadcasting live on YouTube. You can also catch past episodes on demand. Just go to YouTube and subscribe to CBC NL. Many people are afraid of failure. But the thing is that there is a difference between being a failure and failing. Failing forward, these business students won the first ever award for a flop. Ramona Daring explains after this.
Welcome back to Here and Now, and obviously Ryan Snodden is back here. I know that everyone in St. John's and a lot of, sorry, all across the province are waiting for spring, but we in St. John's are often sometimes a little bit sookier, but we, oh, don't, yeah. we don't have it that bad, do we? Just a little. Yeah, <laughs> just, a uh, little. just a little bit sookier. And, but really, you know, we don't have to look far uh, for references for why we really shouldn't be complaining here in St. John's. The West Coast, Labrador, Again, lots of snow on the ground, uh, and in St. Lunaire on the Northern Peninsula, <laughs> this was the scene this morning. That's a beautiful picture. Yeah. For, for like December. For exactly. <laughs> it almost looks like a Christmas photo there. The lights on the, the, lights uh, there. Yeah, <laughs> on the right. porch. Why not leave them up, right? Keep that Christmas spirit right through till July. Uh, especially if Mother Nature's providing the snow, which of course she has been. And again, Labrador City, in case you missed it uh, yesterday, 30 five centimeters of snow there over the last uh, 48 hours. Temperatures, yeah, not too bad here across eastern Newfoundland. Six degrees today, five in central, two in Cornerbrook, one in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and along the coast as the winds are coming in from the north. There's the center of our low where the winds are light, and again, we're in a bit of a southerly flow here, so uh, winds gusting near 60 kilometers per hour today, but at least the winds were from the south. That low departing, and as we back things off, and the radar satellite picture shows our next system quickly moving up through the Maritimes with periods of rain, some snow mixing in through New Brunswick, and that'll be the story for us as well. This is going to be a bit of a messy mix, and as we roll through to tomorrow morning, I am keeping an eye for St. John's up through Clarenville, Bonavista for that morning commute. Likely a bit of mixing, some wet snow, perhaps some ice pellets, the possibility of a bit of freezing rain on the go as well as we'll be right along that dividing line, that warm sector moving through. Uh, looks like a bit of light snow to start the day. Some flurries for Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor, back towards Port of Basque and Cornerbrook. Flurry chances continue for the Northern Peninsula and some snow uh, along that uh, Cartwright and southeast coast of Labrador. Now through Friday morning, that warm air will continue to push in. We're going to be changing over right over to periods of rain through the morning for the Avalon and the Buren. Then it dries out to just some periods of drizzle as winds shift to the south. And even for central Newfoundland, we're going to be seeing snow mixed with ice pelts, freezing rain into the afternoon. But I think Grand Falls, Windsor and West, this stays snow and uh, some accumulating snow in the two to five centimeter range, maybe a little bit more uh, in some of those higher elevation areas like Massey Drive up towards Gross Morn. Temperatures are going to be above the freezing mark, uh, two, three degrees. So we shouldn't see too much in the way of accumulation, but certainly enough to whiten the ground. Eight degrees on the plus side for St. John's tomorrow after that shift to southerly winds. That snow tracking into southeastern parts of Labrador and Nain and Labrador City kind of on the outside looking in with this one. Some sunny breaks, in fact, possible there. As we roll into Saturday morning, snow continues in the southeast. Uh, flurries continue for the west coast. Central stays quiet. A flurry mix with a shower into the afternoon possible. St. John's, I think we'll see a sunny break or two on Saturday and actually not a bad looking day with temperatures likely around the five degree range. Same thing for the Buren Peninsula. And again, there's that messy mix through central onshore flurries for the west. Snow tapering to flurries in Labrador. And a quick look ahead to Sunday shows a brighter day. Again, still a little on the cool side, four or five degrees, a tad cooler than where we should be for this time of year. Still an onshore flurry chance early for Cornerbrook up towards St. Anthony and Cartwright, Happy Valley Goose Bay, but really improving here slowly but surely, especially as we move into next week, which looks really solid. And we'll talk more about that uh, very spring looking forecast coming up with your long range in just a few minutes. Jeremy. Thanks for that, Ryan. We all want to be successful at everything we do. So how about getting a great big trophy for failing? We caught up with four young international students who are proud of winning the prize and who actually hope it will give them a better chance of making this province their home. Ramona Deering has their story. You won't see them sit around very often. Uh, what can I get for you today? Um, can I have they juggle yeah, school I and part-time jobs can and business food? ventures. Um, I'm getting the seafood platter. They're from Bangladesh, studying at Memorial oh, University. Yeah. They've shared their traditional food with others, but they've developed serious cravings for local favorites. Before back home I used to have curry a lot, but now after coming to Newfoundland I would prefer fish and chips more. Coming to St. John's is all about getting set up for the future. They all want to go into business. Marketing is my passion. I want to promote people and local businesses and local talent. And they're getting noticed but maybe not quite the way they'd first planned. 
Memorial Center for Entrepreneurship awarded them this trophy last year. It's called the Fail Tale Cup. That's right, an award for failing. An award they even applied for. However, I'll just give you a brief of why our venture, Asta Foundation, did not take off the way we hoped it to. They'd planned to set up a social enterprise to push for free education here, but received feedback that it wouldn't work. The Fail Tale Cup is all about regrouping and moving forward. Um, many people are afraid of failure, but the thing is that there is a difference between being a failure and failing. If you do not take failure as failure, there's room to succeed. I think it's more of a learning curve in a sense, and every time you fail, you realize what you could have done better. And so they use the center's boardroom to pursue their other business projects. One is their company, Austin Marketing and Communications. Wow. This is the first virtual screeching in the country. The they handled the red and white door for Canadian Tire in St. John's during Canada's 150th. People are going to order online, right? Yes. So we need a supply place. It's going to be like an online thing. It's not going to be a physical store, but it's going to be... Cheap. They're also working on a website that involves local ingredients and reducing food wastage. They're under pressure. These four don't just brainstorm business plans together. So our main focus is to establish this project here in Newfoundland. For the locals. For the locals. They're a family unit and roommates. There's 23-year-old Saif Ahmed, his 21-year-old romantic partner, Maynaz Tabasum, her 18-year-old brother, Adib Rahman, and their 20-year-old cousin, Mamadul Islam Sharov. All business or engineering students, all hungry to immigrate to Newfoundland and Labrador after graduating. Other cities are very fast, so that's why I would love to stay here in St. John's. The friendliness of the place has made a big impression. Tabasum can't forget her second day here. She was 17 and lost. A stranger stopped and drove her and Ahmed to a government office and then a supermarket. That person helped us to do shopping and then later dropped us at our home. So I would like to live in a community where we have this kind of people who are working towards helping one another. They're here on student visas. They plan to apply for permanent resident cards. They also hope to get startup visas offered to entrepreneurs who create jobs. They say being able to stay here would be their definition of success. Ramona Deering, CBC News, St. John's. It's a great story, Ramona. It's not often you hear about people being rewarded for failing. So I got to ask, when is the next round of the Fail Tale Cup going to take place? Well, guess what? There's another one coming up. People can apply during the first two weeks of June, which, dare I say, is right around the corner, really. It's open to all student entrepreneurs at Memorial University, this competition. There is a $1,000 cash prize that goes with it as well. And if people want more information, they can go online to the Memorial Center for Entrepreneurship. Well, Ramona, thanks so much for that story. Thank you. Hi, my name is Keelan, and I got this pup puck from Brett Connolly. She is the six-year-old girl who stole the heart of the nation after others tried to steal her puck.
problem with being the shortest kid around. That kid grabbed the first puck from her. Now look at look at her face. Look at this. Is that the saddest? Look at her. She is devastated. So that frown from that little girl had people talking for days. It was part of a viral video about hockey that has nothing to do with what happened on the ice. The Washington Capitals' Brett Connolly desperately trying to get a little girl a souvenir puck. So many people were upset that the little girl didn't get the puck on the first try. A lot of people wrote on the internet that they were mad, but we here at the CBC wanted to get the full picture. So our friends at the National tracked down the little, the little girl, a first grader named Keelan Moxley. And here's what she had to say about the incident. Hi, my name is Keelan, and I got this puck, puck from Brett Connolly. How did you feel? last night at the Caps game when those boys got the puck and you didn't? I felt devastated, sad, but I felt good for the two boys. But I was kind of sad because I didn't get it. But um, Brad Connolly kept banging on the glass uh, at me. So how did you feel when you did finally get the puck? I felt happy. I felt really happy. And are you going to take the puck to school with you tomorrow? Definitely, yes. That smile will melt your heart. Now this story has a local connection. Brett Connolly's parents, Don and Pat, are from this province. Born and raised on the West Coast, they grew up in the community of St. George's before leaving for the West Coast of Canada in the early 1990s. The couple still lives in British Columbia, and I spoke with Brett's mom, Don, on the phone the other night, and here's a little of her reaction to the viral footage featuring her son. Sent him a little note after the game, and I said, in two days from now, two weeks from now, two years from now, nobody's going to remember whether you won or lost that game, but some people are going to remember the gesture that you made to that young little girl. As a hockey mom, as a hockey parent, we all know the impression that these people have, and it's just really rewarding to see things like this happen, that they can make such a difference in a few seconds of a person's life. It was a very proud moment, I have to say. I'm, I watch hockey, but hockey, the actual game of hockey is not really my thing. The thing that I want my kids to get out of hockey and team sports and just life in general is to be a good person. At the end of the day, we just want people to be good, to treat people the way that we want to be treated. And if you can make a positive influence, then that's what we need to do. There's way too much horrible stuff that goes on in this world and the events of last weekend just bring it home for us that life is so precious we just need to make the most of the opportunities we're given. That's really nice. I mean she's right. What was the score in that game? Uh, I don't remember. I know that uh, Washington didn't win but uh, I wanted to point out something that a lot of people on the internet was talking about was the the father or the gentleman behind who kept he caught all three pucks and then gave them to either child on the side before giving it to Keelan. Now that wasn't Keelan's father. A lot of people on the internet oh. were saying, like, why would he give it to the two brothers? Okay. But Keelan is an only child. Her mom, Lauren uh, Moxley, right. pointed that out on the internet. Okay. But either way... So he was just some sexist guy giving the pucks to the boys, <laughs> isn't it? Pro probably, but probably trying to hook up his own kids. But I know the commentator said that it was uh, her dad and he was trying to get all three kids. But anyways, uh, props to Brett Ruskin. Brett Ruskin. <laughs> Brett Connolly. <laughs> Don't know why I'm giving Ruskin a shout out. Props to uh, Brett Connolly uh, for doing that and going the extra mile to make sure she had an enjoyable game. More than a thousand patients in a BC town are scrambling now to find new care. Most didn't know they were seeing two doctors who had yet to pass their qualifying exams. In a CBC exclusive, Eric Rankin explains what happened. 59-year-old Ray White is a long-haul trucker with a heart condition. But when he recently tried to renew a prescription he needs, he was told it was no longer any good because his family doctors had lost their licenses. I'm very concerned. When you're dealing with the heart, you've, it's got to be, you know, it, it's got to work. If it doesn't work, then you're dead. White is among sure. thousands of patients now wondering about their health care. Dr. Sean and Rosemary Cambridge, husband and wife physicians trained in South Africa, came to Chilliwack in 2011 and were allowed to set up a family practice under provisional licenses and with supervision. As foreign trained doctors, they then had to pass their Canadian qualifying exams. 
But over six years, Rosemary Cambridge failed four times, Sean Cambridge five. After repeated extensions, the regulatory body in the province finally cancelled their registration. Honestly, uh, BC's health minister says supervision of the Cambridges appears to have been lacking. I think a fair person would say that those weren't uh, enforced as much as they might be. But while failing his qualifying exams, Sean Cambridge was billing BC taxpayers, an average of $600,000 a year for his four full years of practice. That's double the national average for a family physician and made him one of the top paid doctors in BC. In a written statement through his lawyer, Cambridge says, we are proud of how hard we work to serve our patients, but it undoubtedly came at the expense of studying for our examination. BC's Health Professions Review Board, which rejected their appeal, was still sympathetic, ruling there's a deeply troubling pattern emerging where foreign trained doctors often face overwhelming patient loads in underserved areas. The Cambridges were originally placed here in Chilliwack because this town has a severe doctor shortage. Now thousands of their former patients could find it next to impossible if they want to find a new doctor to double check their medical diagnoses. Ray White wonders why foreign trained doctors can practice for years without passing their qualifying exams. Can I go out and drive a semi for six months, six years before getting a driver's license, a proper driver's license, taking the exams? No. Late today, BC regulators announced Dr. Sean Cambridge has now been cited for unprofessional conduct for failing to reveal he had first tried to practice in Saskatchewan but was rejected, something BC didn't know when they allowed him to practice here. Eric Rankin, CBC News, Chilliwack, BC. Well, if you missed Zach Gowdy's dizzying story last night on Here and Now, <laughs> There's still a chance to see it again and share it with your family and friends. It's on our website, cbc.ca slash NL. You'll also find photos and video showing how the new science building's steel frame was constructed as well. And it's definitely worth checking out if you haven't seen it. Nerves of Steel, check it out. It's a, it's a great, great item. That looks like a lot of fun. Yeah. Couldn't send Zach up there because it's uh, too dangerous, but look at Occupational that. Occupational health and safety? <laughs> anyway, I was out and about today, okay. and I bumped into a guy who saw Zach's piece last night, and he said, Anthony, I want to talk to you about Zach's piece. And I said, sure. He said, what you were missing in the reporting, and I said, I love Zach's story, it's awesome. But he said, what you were missing is that all those guys put in the girders, they're all up, they're from around the bay. And he said, the real story there is, it's the lengths guys around the bay will go to to look down on townies. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he told me. It was one of the greatest <laughs> lies I've ever heard. <laughs> Well, you are looking at a live shot of Port Union, beautiful Port Union on the northern, on the Bonavista Peninsula, rather, and uh, a pretty nice day on the Bonavista Peninsula today. A little on the breezy side earlier, but you can see the winds have backed off there now, and it's a pretty nice evening. Right now, temperatures are sitting around three degrees. Now, although it's quiet at the moment, we will see more mixed precip working in tonight to eastern Newfoundland, including the Port Union area with some rain on the menu tomorrow afternoon. I'll break down your forecast after the break.
Okay, time to introduce you to somebody special. This is 11-year-old Patrick Lushman of Curling near Cornerbrook. And Patrick plays hockey with the Pee Wee C team and in the Marble RV House League with the Cornerbrook Royals. It's his third year playing hockey, so congratulations, Patrick, on being chosen as our Young Athlete of the Day. I don't think I'm ever going to be invited back. Great I, delivery on that line. Yeah. Great delivery. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, weather time. And, of course, we talked about the weekend, but I do want to talk about next week, which is looking, you know, really, really nice. We, it's been a while since we've had a nice stretch of back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back days. In fact, really last fall is the last time that we've seen a stretch like what is in the forecast right now. Uh, it doesn't look so promising when you look across North America right now. All that warm air has been pushed to the south. Uh, down to the extreme southern states. Everybody else kind of into the double digits, although 12 degrees. Uh, when you see there, it wouldn't be too bad in our neck of the woods. And that is what we're talking about, those double digit type temperatures. And they will be pushing in along with this area of high pressure that's well off to the west right now. But it will make its way here. Again, timeline wise, bit of a messy mix early Friday morning in the southeast, but it's a pretty quick change to rain. That messy mix works up into the northeast and central into the afternoon. Snow for the west coast up towards the northern peninsula through Friday, continuing for Friday night and into Saturday as well. And that snow will hold on a little bit longer uh, for the coast of Labrador, where it's basically onshore flurries for the west coast and not much in the way of accumulation for Saturday itself along the west coast. Now into the long range, again, that system will slowly but surely depart. Uh, the low eventually will catch up to the isobars there. Now Sunday afternoon, you can, can see where it's going to be pretty quiet across the island. Bit of a northerly flow still, so temperatures not really uh, getting up to where they should be until this area of high pressure comes in. Monday, a little bit of spring sunshine, temperatures start to shoot up under some light winds. And then as that high rolls off to the east, we're going to get into a bit of a southerly flow for Tuesday, and this is what will have temperatures on the rise. Nice southerly flow, a bit of sunshine in the mix. Now we will see a bit of cloud building in for Labrador, perhaps some precip chances. Uh, not so certain on the strength of that trough just yet. We will keep you posted on that. It is looking more certain that this system will build in for Wednesday for Labrador, and certainly with that, some rain and, and snow, and then a, a rain event coming into Newfoundland through the day on Thursday from west to east and here is how things will play out then. Uh, temperatures right now this time of year should be around six, seven degrees across the island. So we're going to be near the seasonal mark in the east tomorrow, not so much in central and west. A uh, little cooler than normal through the weekend and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday looking pretty solid indeed. We'll keep our fingers crossed on that. Into Labrador we are seeing that snow through the Friday, Saturday time period, bit of a clear out for Sunday and into Monday, Tuesday. Temperatures start to uh, push up in the Happy Valley Goose Bay area as well. We'll keep our fingers crossed uh, that maybe even some double digits in your neck of the woods next week. That's your forecast now. Jeremy. The mother of a toddler who was found dead in Quebec City is facing a possible murder charge. The body of Rosalie Gagnon was discovered yesterday in a garbage can. She was two years old. Police started looking for her after someone reported an empty stroller in a neighborhood park. The mother, Audrey Gagnon, was found with a man at a nearby apartment. Police spent much of the day interviewing the 23-year-old woman. She was due to appear in court today, but she's now in hospital being treated for what police call self-inflicted injuries. A former Playboy model can now tell her story about Donald Trump without fear of legal threats. Karen McDougall is free from a hush money agreement. Back in that day, I was, I was a different girl. I, you know, I had fun. I was in the Playboy scene. Um, I was just enjoying life as much as I could. McDougal claims she had a 10-month-long consensual affair with Trump in 2006 and 2007. She signed a deal with the National Enquirer just before the presidential election. McDougal's lawsuit alleged the tabloid bought her story for $150,000 so that it could kill the story. The Inquirer's owner is one of Trump's closest allies. As part of the settlement, the company gets as much as $75,000 from the profits should McDougal decide to resell her story. Newly released dash cam video shows a Texas home exploding as police arrive to the scene of a car crash. Officials say an SUV slammed into the home and severed the gas line. Officers found a family of three in the rubble. 
They were taken to hospital and are expected to recover. One of the rescue officers, you can probably see that gentleman right there, was also treated for minor burns in hospital. As for the man behind the wheel of the SUV, he was arrested for driving without a license. That's incredible footage. That's, uh... To make everybody lived. Everybody lived, which is also incredible. Right. Keep that in mind as you take a look at that devastation there. It's quite something. Our viewer picture of the day comes to us from southeastern Labrador. And uh, this picture, a great shot by Fabian Thomas coming back from the cabin at Big Pond. If you can name a community where Big Pond is near in the southeast parts of Labrador, you'll win today's bragging rights. All right, Jeremy, come on. Uh, you don't get here that often. You got to earn your keep. Mary's Harbor. And Welcome back to here now, everyone. Viewer picture of the day comes to us from the Labrador Straits and a beautiful sunset picture in Lance Eclair, uh, which I did not obviously change the banner for this picture. Rainbow for Conception Bay. Yeah, so uh, there, we'll take the banner off because uh, we want to make sure we don't get that confused. Yeah. So that's Lance Eclair. I was close, I was close. Nice. Yeah. Anyway. Good working with you. Thanks. Time to say good night. So long. Go, Leafs, go. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs>